Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm happy to have Mr. Kyle Mills, uh, former New Zealand fast bowler, uh, joining us with us on this chat. Uh, great to have you with us, Kyle. Oh, you know, thank you uh, for having me. Kyle, uh, let's start at the beginning. In your early days, in your backyard cricket matches, uh, your brother, your dad and, and the friends around uh, would ensure that you would only be the 12th man. Is that true? Oh, I'm not so sure about that. I I, uh, I, I didn't really come from a, a cricketing family, to be fair. Uh, my, my father didn't play. Uh, my, my older brother played, but he is about seven or eight years older than me. So I kind of tagged along to a, a lot of his cricket games. And I guess, yeah, I sort of tagged into being 12th man in, in his teams. Uh, but they were all eight years older than me. And... Uh, they're always uh, short, you know, most weekends. So I always got, got on the field and, and got to play and uh, yeah, absolutely loved it. Uh, who was your inspiration growing up uh, uh, in New Zealand in the 80s and uh, so on? Who, 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 did, who inspired you to take up cricket? Yeah, well, look, well I guess there, there, are, there are two standout players being a, a New Zealand cricketer. Uh, one would be Sir Richard Hadley, uh, who's one of the best bowlers ever to play the game, in my opinion, and Martin Crowe, which is the one of the most elegant batsmen that you'd uh, ever come across. And his his record um, was quite amazing, especially when you consider in the 80s and 90s, New Zealand didn't really have, you know, batting conducive wickets yet. His, his stats are, are world class. So those two players were, were two individuals growing up in New Zealand at, at my era were, were the ones you kind of aspired to be. And, and where I just touched on just before, I, I didn't come from a cricketing family at all. But what my father did encourage me was to get involved in my local club. And so very early on, I was always down at my local club, Hauk Packering, a cricket club, on every Tuesday, Thursday night, and, and obviously Saturdays for the games and, and Saturday nights, and speaking to a lot of the, the local club players. And they ended up being my mentors. And, uh, and they took me in. And uh, so I guess... My love of the game really happened in that grassroots level. What uh, really finally triggered your uh, call up to the New Zealand side? Do you still remember that moment when you got a call that you have been uh, selected in the New Zealand side for the first time? Yeah, absolutely, I do. Uh, very clear um, in my memory bank. Uh, it's funny, you know, I uh, that season was it was about my third season of playing first class cricket here for Auckland. And I was batting number five or batting number six for the Auckland Aces cricket team. And only really bowling first change and, and opening the bowling every now and then. That season with the bats, I ended up averaging 100 in first class cricket um, for that season. And I had a great season with the bat. And I, I kind of got my name in the headlines, I guess. And at the end of the New Zealand home summer, which was about March, April, New Zealand had a tour to Sharjah where they played a tri-series against Pakistan and uh, Sri Lanka. And for that series, they, they rested guys like Dion Nash and, and Chris Keynes, those um, bowling all-rounders. And since I was having such a good season with the bat and I could bowl a little bit at that time, uh, I got picked up being to be one of the all-rounders. Uh, and so that's how I got my, my opportunity. Yeah, I wasn't... I didn't have a great season with the ball that year, but my, my batting sort of got my name in headlights, I guess, and made that tour. And at that time, that, that era for the New Zealand team, they, they had lots of all-rounders, guys like Jacob Borum, uh, James Franklin, Daniel Vittori. Uh, so it was quite hard to, to play as an all-rounder. And so I got my opportunity to, to open the bowling uh, against uh, Pakistan uh, at the back end of that series. And I guess the rest is history. Uh, your reputation as an all-rounder, you went on to hit four sixes and four balls against Australia. Do you remember that that particular knock? Yeah, I do. It's a game we probably should have won. We were, uh, well, we, we were behind the eight ball big time. And they managed to, Daniel Vittori and myself, managed to pull off this uh, really good partnership. And uh, uh, we, got our, we got ourselves really close, maybe down to a, a runner ball, I think. And... Um, Daniel Vittori ran himself out and Chris Harris came out to bat because he uh, had dislocated his shoulder fielding. And so this was the second inning. So he ended up batting um, batting 11. And he came out and tried to hold the bat, but he couldn't really do it. Uh, I think we needed 17 off 18 balls or, or something like that. And he lasted for a, a few balls, Harry, but he uh, just couldn't move his arm. And 
and got bowled. But we got ourselves into a position to win the game. And uh, yeah, so at that, that time in my career, I took my batting really seriously. So I was a, a batter coming through first class cricket. Uh, but then I got picked up in the New Zealand team and for, I was 12th man uh, a few times early on and didn't really get many opportunities with the bat my first sort of four or five seasons within New Zealand. And I was always away on tour with the Black Caps and I, my, my batting really sort of fell off the, the boat a little bit and um, I never quite regained it to where I was at the start of my career. You played the 2003 World Cup, you played the 2011 World Cup. 2007, you got injured and couldn't play. 2015, you were part of the squad. Uh, how would you look back at your World Cup career uh, in hindsight? Uh, one with great disappointment. The, the, the World Cup and I just never seemed to, to gel together. Uh, whereas you, you take the Champions Trophy, which was you know, every two years after the World Cup, it was, uh, uh, I think I'm still one of the leading wicket takers of, of the Champions Trophy format. And it's a, it's a competition that I did really well in. But for the World Cup, uh, 2003 in South Africa. Um, we probably should have made the semis, but we didn't go to Kenya for for certain reasons. And uh, I was a young fella in the side, and I only played one game in that World Cup. Uh, 2007, uh, I got injured, had knee surgery, uh, and, and uh, I had to sort that out. So I had to miss that event over in the Caribbean. 2011, made the team for in India, it was, and picked up a niggle at the start of the tournament. It wasn't a major niggle had an issue with my back, and so I had to miss the first few games. I played a couple in the middle of the tournament and started to get, find a bit of rhythm. And I ended up te- uh, tearing my left uh, quadricep uh, in one of the, the round-robin games. So then had to come home from that World Cup. And then the 2015, where we played really well, at, at the back end of my career, I guess I was overtaken a little bit by Tim Southey and, and Trent Bolt uh, in, in the group and didn't manage to play a game at all. So... Uh, I could have ended up playing at four World Cups, but I missed one through an injury and came home for it for another. I ended up playing three games. But but in spite of that, in spite of these disappointments in the World Cup, you were the number one ODI bowler in the world in 2009. What was that feeling like, being the best bowler in one-day cricket in, in a particular season? Oh, look, without question, assuming a great feeling in respect to... Uh, I wrote it down as a goal. It was a goal I actually wrote down with one of my bowling coaches at the time, Dale Hadley, who's uh, Sir Richard's brother. And we, we wrote it down together um, that I wanted to be the number one ranked ODI bowler in the world. And so to knock it off after something you had written down was was certainly, certainly very satisfying. Uh, but it was also um, a time where we were playing quite well as a team. And, you know, I'm a team guy and uh, New Zealand uh, cricket team tends to play really well when, when they gel together as a side. And, and around that time, we had some really good series wins as well. And uh, I, was, I guess I kind of took it upon myself because we had the, a lot of retirements of guys like Chris Keynes and, and Dion Nash and, and Shane Bond was always in and out through injury. That, uh, we had a young bowling group coming through and I really took it upon myself to try and lead that group. And uh, yeah, to knock off that goal was, was fantastic. You speak about the uh, transition phase in New Zealand bowling attack around the time you became the number one bowler. How difficult or easy was it to lead a, side, a, lead a bowling group at that time, uh, especially when you had guys from a previous era going away, newer guys coming in? Uh, was it, is it a tricky phase for someone like someone who's trying to find his own uh, space in world cricket? Um, well, I guess if you look at the New Zealand bowling group now, there's a lot of depth. In, in the bowling group now. You look at guys like Southey, Bolt, Wagner, uh, Henry. You've got this Kyle Jamison who's on the scene now. So there's a lot of depth in that group. Whereas back then, uh, in the fast bowling department, I guess there wasn't a huge amount of depth. But we had a lot of guys coming in and out through injury as well. Jacob Borum was injured a bit. I was injured sometimes, and so was Shane Bond. So uh, and I remember J- John Bracewell, the coach at the time, really sitting me down, and, uh, and he sort of, over a coffee, and he said, look, he looked me in the eye and said, mate, I, I need you to lead this group for me. We, we got, we're lacking quite a bit of experience, and uh, we, we feel like you're the, the guy with the right character, I guess, to try and drag these young guys along. And also fortunate at that time to have Daniel Vittori uh, in the group, and even though he's, he's a spin bowler, but he was certainly a world-class spin bowler. He, he, he led the group as well very um, very well by his, his pure stats, um, on the board, I guess, and 
So it was good to have him there as well because you could always bank on 10 overs from Daniel Vittori really being on the money. And, and if I could produce 10 good overs and then drag the other guys along, um, we we'll, would we'll go pretty close. Which of the captains that you played under had the biggest impact on you? Look, I, I had uh, three... Well, I actually had four captains. Uh, Craig McMillan was my first captain, but only for a couple of games. But you, I look back at Stephen Fleming, uh, and then there was Daniel Vittori, and, and the last captain was um, Brendan McCullum. And, and three very different captains. Uh, you know, I guess in, in recent times, you've got Brendan McCullum, who's quite aggressive, um, really backs his players, and is, is a very attacking captain. Daniel Vittori is certainly a lot more conservative uh, as a captain, uh, but he was a big uh, statistician, I guess, and, and really looked at the numbers in, in the opposition and, and within our group as well. And you've got a guy like Stephen Fleming, who, who's very uh, articulate as a person and very bright and uh, is a really good communicator and conveying messages, I guess. And he, he drew a lot of, um, you know, because he was my, one of my first captains, so I was very impressionable, at the time, I guess, but uh, I, I guess I really enjoyed his style of captaincy because um, he, he, he kind of led from the front in his words and, and his planning. He was very um, had a great method in his planning, and we were going about to approach a game or, or a series as well. Um, and obviously, later on in my career, when I'm a more experienced cricketer, you got a guy like Brendan McCullum who, who's very aggressive. which is quite funny in a way because as a bowler, I was quite conservative, so him and I had to try and get on the on the same page as well. So I was very lucky to play uh, under three very different captains. And when you got a chance to lead New Zealand in a few one-day matches, was it a mix of all the styles that you had adopted? Obviously, it was a big honour for you to lead New Zealand. Yeah, a massive honour. Um, you know, it's not something you sort of seek out to do. And I, I guess I was handed the, the skipper's armband through um, uh, Brendan McCullum resting um, or he may have been injured from Pro Tour. So uh, I guess I'd, um, you, you still got to try and be your own person when, when you're in that position. You don't really want to copy anyone else um, because you need to be authentic. And and the way I kind of played the game was uh, with a bit of passion, I guess. And I tried to install that in, into the guys at that time. And um, yeah, and so I sort of tried to stamp my mark on on the team when I when I had the reins, I guess. Uh-huh. And then you had a special love affair with South Africa. Uh, you loved them to bits, uh, especially Graham Smith and Faf to Plessy. Uh, do, you, do you look back at those moments uh, and uh, so, sort of have a laugh about it now, about what happened then? Or what was, what was those moments like? Uh, I, I guess New Zealand, South Africa, Australia, are, are very, we're all very similar in culture. And not only in cricket, but also rugby is a big sport for all three countries as well. So... I guess we all kind of, those three countries, we kind of think the same as well, and we know each other so well. Uh, the Graham Smith battles um, were, were really tough battles. Um, again, a time in New Zealand where I was trying to be a leader within the group and really tried to lead from the front, and Graham Smith was also a young captain at the time, and uh, they were just, uh, you know, the South African cricket team, they're fighters. You know, they don't, they don't give an inch, and uh, at that time, we were trying to stamp our mark on the style of cricket we're trying to play and uh, they're great battles. I get on really well with Graham Smith now. There's a lot of respect for each other. Uh, the the Faf Duplessis um, situation, I look back on with uh, great embarrassment and great regret, to be completely honest. Uh, and I've spoken to Faf heaps of times about this. Again, we get, we both get on, on really well now. But at that time, um, I was completely embarrassed. We touched on the, my World Cup record just before. So that's the 2000 and 11 Cricket World Cup. It was a quarterfinal game in Dhaka. And I was about to go home back to New Zealand. I was ruled out injured at this stage. Failed the fitness test for that game. And I was flying home back to New Zealand the very next day. So I wasn't in a a great mental state or mental place at that time. Uh, It was a World Cup where I was really looking forward to. I felt like I was in career best form leading into it. And I'm about to go home um, back on a plane. Uh, it was a game of cricket that I really wanted to be part of, a knockout game against South Africa, a, a side that New Zealanders, we love playing against them because the style of cricket both teams played. And so I wasn't in great mental place. I was disappointed. I was angry about being injured again. And I guess I let my frustrations out on the field. It wasn't a great look. Wearing a red bib, getting involved in something. I, 
uh, said something to Faf when he just run out AB de Villiers, I think it was, and uh, well, I was running the drinks out to the guys, and I just said something stupid. I should never have said anything. I completely regret it. I look back on it with uh, one of the, with great embarrassment and one of my most regretful things I ever did on a cricket field. Uh, when you retired finally, uh, were you contented that the fact that you have a ready replacement set of bowlers uh, to take over from whatever you had started because you you were sort of holding a bridge between two different generations? Were you contented that you had created a, a, a ready re- set of replacement bowlers for yourself in New Zealand cricket? Look, that, that, that was the start of a, a great bowling group, which is, which is doing really well in international cricket now for New Zealand. And Tim Salvey, I think he made his debut for New Zealand around 2008, I think. Came in as an 18, 19-year-old and, and did exceptionally well. And that was, a, again, that, that time where I was leading the, the bowling groups. I, I, I guess you could say I, I took Tim Southey under my wing and because we were both very similar bowlers, um, try to swing the ball away from the right-hand batter. And uh, so I just try to implant as much knowledge and as much experience that I had learned in the game onto Tim Southey. And once we got to that 2015 World Cup, he was he was really rocking. He was in great rhythm, great control, great planning of the opposition and individuals in the opposition. And Trent Bolt had come on the scene as well. And he was uh, Matt Henry, Adam Milne was bowling super fast at the time. And yeah, I take great pride because one of my responsibilities at that World Cup, even though I wasn't playing games, I still had to try and lead the group and, and contribute somehow. Because at the end of the day, whether you're not, if you're not playing, you still want to contribute in some way. And the only way I could contribute was trying to lead that bowl in the group, uh, even though I was on the park, but try and give them lots of confidence and, and arm them with the, the right, I guess, mental skills and physical skills to, to take on the, the opposition, opposition at that time. Now we have slid into the role of a, uh, of a coach. You've also done a bit of commentary work, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, yeah, well, I guess, you... yeah, I, I have. I, I just love the game. I, I just like watching cricket and uh, I like uh, helping people. So uh, with, with the commentary stuff, I, I really enjoyed that because you're learning a new skill. Uh, you can play as much cricket as you want, but to actually go out and talk about it and have good conversations with fellow commentators and um, and understand other people's opinions on the game and sort of be brave enough, have courage to, to voice your opinion out to millions of pe- people and it's a new skill like to talk properly, uh, try to increase your vocabulary a, a, a little bit and do two things at once. It's always hard talking and having a producer in the ear and, and, and that side of the game. So I, I really enjoyed that aspect of it. And the coaching, um, I guess, role is I just like helping people. If I see young cricketers and whether I have the right answers or the wrong answers, I just like trying to help young cricketers along, just give them other options. And, and now I have this opportunity with KKR where we're meant to be in the IPL at the moment, I was really looking forward to that, and hopefully, it will take place later on in the year. But uh, look, a short tournament, seven, eight weeks, uh, players from different cultures uh, West Indians, English, Australians, Kiwis, uh, the local Indian boys, and young Indian fellas as well. So, and quite often, you know, they kind of sit back because it's a respect thing in, in that culture, but to try and drag them forward and and implant some knowledge onto them and, and try and lead them in a, in a high-pressure environment it was something I'm, I'm really looking forward to. You played in the IPL as well. How was your experience when you played in the IPL? Well, I was there. I, I went to the first IPL with Kings XI Punjab, but I was only there for four games because New Zealand had a tour of England. Uh, so the New Zealand players only went up for four games, and I was competing with Brett Lee for the, the bowler's spot, I guess, for Kings XI, and he... He clearly got that. He's, a, he's an amazing bowler. In the following year, I went to Mumbai Indians, where it was in um, uh, South, South Africa. Africa. That's right, yeah. And uh, didn't play a game there as well because uh, Malinga was our, was our strike bowler and he was amazing for, for Mumbai Indians, still is. So I never got to play a game. And the following year, I was meant to go to, back to Mumbai again, but I had a, a shoulder reconstruction on my shoulder. Um, so... Yeah, I guess a missed opportunity, I guess. And then from then on in, I never got picked up to, to play in the IPL. And I would love to have gone over and play in that high pressure environment. I think it's a different feeling than international cricket, without question. It's just a different environment. Um, but, you know, uh, I was just glad to be part of it. 
uh, finally, I uh, want to talk about one last thing. Uh, your, is it true that you love horse racing? Uh, is that is that a very important part of your life, horse racing? Yeah, I, I guess it is. I grew up in a horse family, so I don't really have much of an option uh, when I was a young kid, I guess. And uh, for, for, for me, when you're a cricketer or, a, or an international sports person, you, you need an outlet. You need something else to take your mind to and to, to get away from cricket. Cr- cricket's a tough game, especially test cricket. You've got five days in a row and you've got the trainings. And, and as you know, and as we all know, cricket's a big mental game. You can play, you can have the best cover drive or the best outswinger or the best forward defence, but if you're not mentally tough, uh, you, you'll, you'll struggle to survive in international cricket. So, But if you, if you think too much about the game, it, it, it can become too much, I feel. So you kind of need that outlet. And some guys play golf. Some guys shoot off to the movies. They, they do other things. Um, but for me, horse racing is a is a is a passion of mine. I, I follow it, and uh, it was just a good break away for me from cricket. Thanks a lot, Kyle. It was really enjoyable chatting with you and going back in your career. I hope you have a great time. You stay safe and stay indoors. Good man. Thank you. Yeah.